All right, guys, good afternoon. It's me, I'm back here. We're gonna give everybody a couple minutes to trickle in. If you have anything you wanna ask before we start, go ahead and type it in the chat. Please understand that uh, this is the first time that we're using um, YouTube. We've been invited to do this YouTube Live uh, presentation here this afternoon, and we decided we're gonna take them up on it and use the technology. So there is a delay. So there's a delay of about 10 seconds between, I guess, when I say something and, uh, and it pops up on the screen. And uh, also similarly then for you to uh, type something into the chat. But if somebody wants to just uh, pop something in the chat box there, go right ahead. And otherwise, we will start rolling here in just a second. All right, so welcome, everybody. So I'm Adrian Manns. Um, you are here because you're interested in some first hour trading strategies. And I am going to talk to you about what it is that we do for a living around here and what we've done since uh, it's 1997 that we started trading the markets uh, live each and every day. And uh, it's been an interesting journey, right? And it's along the road, what we found out is a lot of people are super interested in what we're doing and they want to uh, take part in this kind of stuff as well. And it's been very, very rewarding for us to share what we do and talk about how we do it and then encourage other people to explore just what it is that, uh, that we're talking about. So before we start, just let me tell you, uh, this is not a sales pitch and you are not getting a load of offers here to uh, subscribe to something. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you three strategies that we use around the opening bell. And I'm going to discuss exactly what it is that we do with those three strategies to earn our living and how we do that all in about the first one hour of the trading day. When we're all done, you're going to get a download link for a, uh, an ebook, and the book contains all these strategies that I'm going to talk about today. So you don't have to take notes today. You can watch the replay of the webinar, certainly, if you want to, um, and then take notes. But I prefer that what you do here is ask questions if you have them, just so that we know what's, uh, you know, what's going on and what you're thinking about. If um, you see something you like, then by all means, let us know and understand that we're going to give you a couple weeks of just an open house to come and see what it is that we do. Follow us live. You can see us trading all these strategies live. You can see the guys who have been to our boot camp trading this live. They're all professional traders. They've all been doing this for a while and uh, you can talk to them as well and get a feel for how this stuff plays out over time. All right, so let's get started. Let me tell you who we are when I say we. I am part of a trading team, a professional trading team that consists of my wife, Julie and I, and uh, we have been trading together since we were in graduate school. So since grad school, we have been a trading team that focuses on some statistical um, variations of what goes on in the markets. And we go and then we take the statistics that we use in analyzing market data and we apply that stuff to real time trading data each and every day of the year. So we started trading Back in 1997, we developed some models. The models that we developed were based on multivariate analysis of covariance and on some basic statistics stuff, and they were very robust. And over the years, we've been able to use those models to trade for a living. And uh, I think that when I get through this presentation, you are going to find that most of this stuff is overcomplicated by people. And that, uh, you know, what I really seek to do in presenting this to everybody is lessen that complication. So let me tell you, I'm just going to give you a little uh, preview here of some of the ideas that I've presented in the past and where those ideas have been uh, featured. I have over the years written for just about every uh, journal and magazine that talks trading. Uh, that there is out there both nationally and internationally. And, um, you know, I think that the important thing when you publish is that you make things very clear and that you don't have a bunch of secrets out there. So nothing that I'm doing is a black box. And you're going to see pretty quickly here how you can take this stuff and apply it yourself 
in the same way that thousands of people have applied it over the years. And really, you should be able to take what I'm talking about right now and start working with it tomorrow morning. So, you know, Monday is a little bit of training, and Tuesday you should already be looking at this on the job and sort of figuring out does it fit into the way that you want to trade and the way that you like to trade, essentially. So, along with the journal articles and everything, I wrote a bunch of books. So, Around the Horn, A Trader's Guide to Consistently Scoring in the Markets. That was out in 2003 originally, and it's been through numerous uh, issues ever since, right? Numerous publications. And, uh, you know, we're on the fourth printing of that book, and we'll be uh, on the fifth printing before you know it. That's sort of the gold standard for everything that I've done. Now, you don't have to run out and buy the book to figure out what we're going to talk about here today, because what I'm focusing on today is a strategy called fastball. It's an expansion of range and volume. You're going to figure out pretty quickly here. I wrote the whole book around a baseball metaphor, and that baseball metaphor then is the basis for, uh, you know, sort of making these things easier to understand. When I first started doing this and putting together this publication, we were in an academic setting, and I titled the thing originally a multivariate analysis of covariance in the U.S. equities market, and my publisher laughed at me, and he said, you know unless your mother's looking to buy a hundred copies of this thing, you're not going to be selling any books. So come up with something else. So I'm a baseball fan. Unfortunately, just watched my Dodgers go down, but uh, we decided that putting the notion of trading in a metaphor that equates it with various baseball strategies and baseball terms was an easy way to remember it. If that doesn't make it easy for you, then just convert it to what does make it easy, right? There's something that you can look at. As you can see there, the Italian version of my book is entitled World Cup Trading. It's built around a soccer analogy. The uh, version that's published for the rest of the world is called Beat the Street, and that one goes through and changes the metaphor and just calls it what it is, right? A double header is a kings and queens. A fastball is called an expansion of range and volume. And as time went on, we published more and more things, as you can see there. And, you know, Trade Secrets is a book that focuses exclusively on the strategy that I'm going to introduce you here to tonight, which is the fastball expansion, uh, expansion of range and volume, excuse me. And that's a trade that forms the cornerstone of our trading philosophy because we trade cyclicality in markets. That's really what Around the Horn is all about. Around the Horn isn't about a baseball metaphor or you know moving around the horn of the bull and all that stuff. Those are all great ways to remember this stuff. What Around the Horn refers to is markets are cyclical and a market in any security is cyclical. So when you start looking at sectors and you see that they're in a period of markup or markdown, those are times that they're very tradable. When they start to consolidate, right, when a security is traveling sideways, when it's being accumulated or distributed, getting ready for markup or markdown, that's where you run into problems. So what we try to do is we take a pattern like fastball and we know that that's the starter, right? That's the first place that a stock begins its journey through the market cycle. And we know that that's then going to be followed by things like switch hitter and infield fly and all the other patterns that I talk about in the book. But fastball is really the one that gives you the biggest bang for your buck. And that's why I want to talk about that one here today first. All right. So the fastball expansion move. This one is pretty simple to wrap your head around. Let me just get the rest of the points up here on the slide for you so that uh, you, know, you can look these over as we talk about it. So the fastball expansion of range and volume, what this trading setup is all about is you're going to find the stocks in the market that are making a big move. So you're looking for the widest range of the past 10 sessions, you're looking for big volume. You're looking for the widest range, the widest volume, really, of the past 10 sessions. And you're looking for the sign that the institutions who are responsible, really, for moving stocks in the market are at work, right? The stock is in play. So typically, um, you know, what we look for, I've got in the example here today, I'm talking about the short sales setup. So just realize that there's also a long version of the long is just the opposite of the short, right? The short sale is based on a trending stock 
makes a pullback move, and then makes a wide range move back in the direction of that original trend. So the widest range of the past 10 sessions, I like to see it start in the top of the bar, move down into the bottom of the bar, so that the open is at one extreme, the close is at the other extreme, and then it's really simple. The next day, I'm just looking to short the stock 10 cents below the low of the bar that made that fastball expansion of range and volume move. So if that sounds counterintuitive, just hang on a second because I'm going to show you exactly what it is that I'm talking about in a second here. It's really easy to wrap your head around, and I'll just reiterate, this particular trade, simple as it is, right? You're not going to hear me talking about, you know, here's a bunch of indicators you can buy and slap all over your screen and, and confuse the price data. We trade from price and volume, and that's it. And this trade will show you as the cornerstone of our trading business exactly why keeping it so simple is the way to go. Because fastball, even on the most replicable part of our around the horn trading plan, so you're gonna get access to this thing over the next couple of weeks. And you'll see we've got every trade back to 2006 on the trading plan available for you to look at. And when you go back and you see these things, you're gonna see just that one trade is responsible for roughly 60 points of profitability per year, $60 per share of profitability. Yet it's a very simple strategy to wrap your head around. And that's just on the one trading plan. That's the most replicable portion of the trading plan. That's the one that we've got all the entries, all the exits, all the stops, all the targets. Those go out the night before. And then as students of ours, or as people who are just working with us on this, on this journey that we're on, you go through and the first job is, can I replicate, can I simulate it? Can I replicate in a simulator exactly what he's talking about? Oh great, I got it on the simulator. Now, can I replicate it with real money trades, with small shares? Yes, I can do it. Well, so now I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna try to replicate these things in the bigger picture and make it a part of my actual trading business. So if you focus on the fact that that's just one part of what we do, and then look out at the rest of what we do. There's the around the horn plan, there's the stocks to watch plan, there's the stocks on the radar plan. Then after those, we've got the fastball XRV trading plan and the NASDAQ scalper plan. Once you wrap your head around the fact that these things are not confusing and are in fact very, very doable each and every trading day, because you'll see our guys doing them with us. It's not just Julie and I who are able to trade these, it's all the people we've trained over the years are able to get there and just knock the cover off the ball every day because what this is, is a work process issue, right? You're not going in and trying to reinvent anything. What you're trying to do is just go in, find the trades that make sense over the session, look at them in proper order in the morning, and then as the trades come in and move through, you're just moving steadily from one trade to the next and it's a very organized system a very precisely engineered way of looking at the markets and trading the markets. So let's look at some enhanced criteria for this fastball uh, setup that I call XRV. And the enhanced setup is a little bit different because what it does is it filters stocks looking for signs of institutional markup or markdown. So what we do is we take that pattern that I'm going to show you and we build on it. So I've had a scanner built that goes through and looks at alternative data sources and what it allows me to do is say, well look, if we have a stock that has made this expansion of range, expansion of volume move, then go drill down a little bit further and tell me where that move is coming from. So where did the move originate? Was it with an institution? And the way that we tell if it was an institution is our scan goes through and it's looking for block trades. It's looking for evidence of institutional activity. It goes and starts pairing those things up and then it evaluates whether or not the move that was being created over the course of the session was persistent. So did the institutional buyer or seller come into the market and start buying stock or start selling stock and then back off a little bit and wait for price to come back 
And when price came back again, or maybe they pushed price higher or lower themselves to get it back towards that volume weighted average price that they work from, when price got there again, did they start then pushing it in the direction it was going because of their original activity, right? So they were a seller, they backed off, price came back in again. As soon as it got back to where they were willing to sell some more, they started selling. And then the software is looking for that activity into the close. You can look for this yourself as well. So you don't have to have um, you know, a $25,000 scanning algorithm that goes through and, and finds these things for you. You can just dig through the tape once you find these expansion, range, and volume setups. Now the difference between the way that we trade this XRV setup as opposed to the straight up fastball setup is that I think you noticed on the textbook variety that I developed so long ago, what I'm doing is I'm looking for natural support and resistance and that's how I'm setting my profit objective. I go out to a daily chart and I say, where is support, where is resistance and that's what I'm gonna target. And what I want you to do is when you look at the data going back to 2006, you'll be able to pull every single trading plan that I published since 2006. You'll be able to pull our results since 2006. And please note, those are, as I said, the most replicable part of the plan. So they're traded exactly the way that they're planned. We get in at the entry price. If we get 50% of the distance to our profit target, we move our stop to break even. If we get 10 cents of the distance to the profit target, we move our stop to 50%. And of course, if we hit our stop loss, we're out of the trade altogether. These things are all things that we can automate. So we focus on making our life around here as easy as we can, and we definitely focus on we are trading the first hour of the session, and once that's over and done, hour, hour and a half, we are usually out of here, right? And we're letting the machine take care of it. So let me show you now um, what the differences are. And then I'll show you the, the two setups. Now remember, fastball, looking for support and resistance, looking for a place to say on a five minute chart, this is where I'm gonna put my stop. On a daily chart, this is where I'm gonna put my target. And I know how I'm gonna trade around these things because of the rules. XRV, very similar setup, except it's traded on the NASDAQ very frequently, whereas the Around the Horn plan is a NYSE only kind of a trading setup, and that's something I'll get into in another session about why our focus initially was all on stocks that are traded on the New York Stock Exchange. It has to do with the fact that we're both psychologists, and back when we started trading, our focus was on New York Stock Exchange used a specialist to trade stocks. That's one person, and you can get to know the psychology of the person on the other end of the trade. Whereas with these NASDAQ-based stocks, it's tons of market makers are pushing these things around. Okay, So in the case of the NASDAQ variety, we're not looking so much for natural support and resistance for our targets. We're tar targeting $1 or a floor trader pivot line, which is just baked into every piece of software you've ever seen in your life. Nothing to buy, nothing to, nothing to set up. You just find your floor trader pivots and you're going to say $1 or the first floor trader pivot that gets in my way. That's going to be my profit objective. And the stops in these are going to be a little bit wider to begin with. They're based on a wider swing on a five minute chart. So you're looking at the chart that gave you the setup. On that chart, you're going to find where that five minute uh, support and resistances, but you're going to remember that on your NASDAQ listed securities, you're going to get more price elasticity. Okay? On your NYSEs, you got one guy. That guy is setting some tight parameters around his trade. He sees it the way he sees it. So think, think like a psychologist, right? You're dealing with a human being on the other end of this thing. It's one human being who's primary, primarily responsible for making a market. And that person is pretty easy to figure out in terms of where he draws the value lines, where he sees the zones that a stock should be trading in. NASDAQ, you've got a lot of different things going on, a lot of different people responsible for setting those, a lot of different market makers, a lot of different fingers in the pie. So it makes for a looser setup. The New York Stock Exchange variety of this trade, I've always got better than a one-to-one one -one re uh, reward to risk ratio on right out of the gate. The NASDAQ version, I've got wider stops and I'm looking to pull those stops into place based on what happens in the first five minutes of the trading day. But you're going to get to be more of an expert on that 
as you spend a little bit of time with us, uh, you know, looking over our shoulders for the next couple of weeks, you'll see exactly what it is that I'm talking about. Now, let's take a look at how we trade these volatility expansions. All right. And what I want to do here is show you an idealized example of how the setup works. Mm -hmm. So this would be for a short sale. And what you're looking at here is a chart of daily bars. Okay. All the bars that you're looking at on this chart are going to be daily uh, time compression. So every single thing is taking place over the course of an entire day of trading. And then you see that we have this big move to the downside over the course of multiple days. It's followed by a pullback. And once the pullback is in place, it really just gets back up into sort of overhead support and resistance. And then we get that fastball breakout. We get the expansion of range. Hopefully there's an expansion of volume and based on what we see on this daily chart, what we want to do is the following day, I'm going to get short 10 cents below the low of the bar that created the setup. Okay. And for the fastball XRV variety, I'm going to be pretty aggressive about getting into that position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my trade up so that I'm going to get short on a violation of that low. My target zone is 10 cents below the low of the bar, but I'm going to accept anything from a penny below that low down about 20 cents. So my maximum slippage on this, right? Slippage refers to the price you want versus the price you're going to get is going to be about 10 cents per share in addition to what we were looking for when we were getting in. But let me show you what it looks like on an actual chart. Okay, so here's NEOG. And uh, this one, okay, you've got, you can see here, you have these big things happening on a chart, right? You've got a wide range expansion move in terms of both the range on the day and the volume that occurred. And you're sort of putting together pieces of a puzzle, right? So I'm off to a boot camp to work with 20 folks who are going to be doing this stuff for a living. And my whole goal at that event is to say to them, listen, this is not mysterious and this is not something that you have to go out and buy a dozen indicators to figure out. What you have to do is start looking at this as pieces of a puzzle, All right? What's this out here? What's all this volume by price data tell us as we move down through the range of that bar? tells us that we had heavy selling right in the middle of that range going into the close of the trading day. Now, how do we confirm this? We drill down from that daily chart where we saw the setup and we look at a five minute chart from the setup day. You see all this real heavy selling pressure. Now, as that pressure moves the stock down into the close of the day, what you want to do is look for the things you saw on that daily chart, right? So you can see we've got escalating selling pressure going into the close of the day. You've got lots of volume by price. So if you don't know what volume by price is, it's just some people know it as volume profile. Really it's out on that, out on the right side of the chart, right? Those horizontal volume bars tell you where volume went off at every single price. Whereas on the bottom of a chart, those volume bars are telling you what happened over a given period of time. So in this case, it's a five minute chart. Every plotted volume bar on the bottom axis is telling you what happened during a particular five minutes. Whereas out on the right side, the horizontal bars are telling you, all right, this is the price that we gravitated to on the way down. And you can see right there where the heaviest selling was. So as the stock sold off in the morning, whoever was responsible for moving this lower was focusing on the volume weighted average price and trying to get a drift back up into the range. Then when they got down into the end of the day, this is the kind of thing that we want to see where you get the big sell off into the close and the heaviest volume right down at the bottom of the price range. So this is all telling us we've got a real good probability of having a follow through day, the, the next session that's going to make us, uh, 
uh, profits on the, on the trade. So here you can see the way that I set these up, because you should be asking, well, gee, how much of this can I automate, right? Because I'll tell you right now what my day looks like. I get up at about 5.45 in the morning. We live in, uh, on the Pacific Coast, right? We're in, outside of Los Angeles. And the time frame here is real bad for me in terms of uh, working efficiently. So what I do is I set these orders up the night before so I don't have to think so much the next day. Now in your case, you'd be trading whatever share size you're comfortable trading. So I should have probably changed that quantity to one um, just to show you you know, what the, uh, the idea is here with these bracket orders. But what's going to happen based on the way that this order is set up is you see that there is a, um, a value called stop price. That stop price is $73.48. Don't think of that as a stop, okay? A stop in terms of, of market terminology and floor trader terminology, a stop is the level at which something happens. And in this case, $73.48 is our activation price, right? That stop price activates an order. The limit price, that's the worst price that we're willing to accept. In this case, $73.38. So, We've got a stop loss, you see it there in that red bar, $73.88. And what that means is, if we get triggered into this position, then what's going to happen is, if price moves higher and hits $73.88, it's going to take us out of the trade. It's going to stop us out for a loss. On the other hand, we have a profit stop at $72.38. So you can see there that if we hit 72.38, it's going to close us out of the position that we established uh, at $73.48 earlier. And then what happens is this automation makes it entirely possible for us to just walk away from the machine once these things are trading. Now, important to note here is in this particular application, this is called Realtek, I can specify different exit quantities. So, I'm making sure that my quantity on the way out is 100% of what I was traded in for. So let's say that I was looking for 1,000 shares and I only got filled 630 shares, right? My exit, I don't want to exit out of this position for 1,000 shares because then I would be long for, you know, I, I'd be long the balance. What did I say? 600 shares. So if I was short 600 shares, I don't want to go and buy 1,000 because then I'd be long 400 shares. So it's only going to close me out for the quantity that it put me in from uh, for. So that's a bracket order, and it's it's a great way to structure an order. It's got a lot of benefits. It does complete order structuring. That OCO order, like I said, is gonna it's gonna kill the other order. OCO means uh, order cancels order. So when the exit order triggers either on the profit or the loss, it's gonna cancel the other leg of the order. And um, another real nice thing about these is in Realtek anyway, and a lot of trading software, uh, Realtek TradeStation, um, you know, I'm pretty sure uh, Thinkorswim, you can have these orders populate the chart so that if you want to change your order, you can just grab a line on the chart and move it. Um, you don't have to go back in and fumble around with a mouse and try to change the order in that, in that montage there. It's a really just easy order to work with, and it's fully automated. Now, the drawbacks of bracket orders is it, they're primarily focused on the fact that when a bracket order is in place, um, what's going to happen with the bracket is your assets are impounded by your broker for margin, right, the second that you place the bracket order. So if the bracket order doesn't fill you, if you don't get a position with the bracket order, that money's not available to trade something else. Usually not a problem if you're structuring your orders properly, right? But if, if you have a smaller trading account and you know, you're trying to work multiple instances of these orders and you want to be able to trade larger shares but you don't want um, all your margins sucked up, then there's a different kind of an order. We're not going to talk about it in depth here today. It's called a conditional order. And a conditional order just sort of sits on top of a bracket order and it says, in our case when we use them, they're going to say, look, price has to be coming from the proper direction. So if I'm looking to get short the stock, if I'm looking for a move lower, 
then what I want to know for sure is the stock started from higher up. So it's coming down through my price and getting me in in the proper direction. So I don't want to have an order out there that triggers me in while this uh, computer is not attended right where the stock's shooting it to the upside. The conditional order lets it me say, all right, it's got to start trading above the range and then move down through. And if it starts below the range, the assets are never impounded and we've got the opportunity then to trade something else. Okay, so let's look at an example here of uh, how NEOG plays out. So here you can see what happened the day of this NEOG trade. So you had a move down through that prior low and the stock never came close to moving up to the level that our stop loss would have been at. The stop loss in this case would have been uh, initially anyways up above that 74.55 range. Um, that's because that's where we see some nice support and resistance and I'm going to look for what happens around the open to determine where my stop's going to be based on what's happening today. Okay, So in this case, when it moves down through that prior low, it triggers us in and it immediately makes a move down to that profit objective. So once it hits that profit target, we reset things. I'll just load those orders back up again if and only if it happens in the first probably, you know, 90 minutes of trading. I'm going to be realistic and say, you know, an hour, the first hour trader for us is really about an hour and a half on a lot of days. But you can see here, this one did it in the second bar. So it comes up, trades up through that second bar and makes another move down through the profit target. So you get an entry right on the open. You get a move down to the profit target in the first five minutes of trading. Second five minutes of trading gets you right back in again. And by the time we're a half hour into the trading session, you've been down to the profit objective again. Could you have traded back into this at the entry? Yeah, you know, if you waited and you can see there around 11 a.m. it got back up through there again. But the reality here is, you know, the, the part of the country that I live in, I am by that time of the morning, I'm either hiking up the canyon, I'm hiking on the beach, or I'm hanging out with Julie and Connor. You know, we've got a 10-year-old kid who is... Uh, brightest sunshine and just the joy of our lives and we spend as much time with him as we can. So you guys know I do a lot of traveling, I do a lot of speaking uh, for the exchanges and stuff. I go out there and do these presentations and every time that we do that we take our boy with us, we homeschool him most of the time and you know we're exposing him to the world because of the business that we're in. This trading, uh, first hour trading stuff has been fantastic and over time what it's enabled us to do is you know, Connor's been to London six times, he's been to Paris six times, he's been all through Europe. Um, it's made for a very different childhood than a lot of people have, and it's all because of this kind of thing right here. So these trades tend to book very consistent profits. I will tell you, you know, if you when you go back and look at these, um, you'll have access to these as well when you're on the site. Like I said, when you start, just paper trade them. Don't go loading up a bunch of shares. You want to make sure that you're staying as conservative uh, as you possibly can be when you're first looking at a trading strategy. So if you see these things are you know ripping for profits and you hear the guys talking about how they're doing with them, you know just understand tomorrow is another day and it's always going to be based on the same thing. We are not a penny stock trading room. We are not a pump and dump room. These are all big board stocks. These are all stocks that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ and you can see they're all stocks that are you know probably 25 to to hundred dollars per share so these are stable instruments that we're trading and you don't have to rush in you can start with you know one share five shares ten shares whatever when you finally do go live I recommend simulate first because when you uh, simulate your trading what it does for you is if you're using a good simulator, like we use Trading Sim quite a bit, I can tell you even 20 years later, Julie and I will sit around and we'll pull up the trading simulator and we'll simulate for two, three hours just because that's what we're doing while we're hanging out, right? Julie, hey, let's, let's scalp Apple or let's work with, uh, you know, let's go back through these XRVs and see how they're tracking. You're gonna enjoy doing that and it's, it's a nice way to get your feet wet with this stuff without, um, you know, without risking any money. And um, 
you can find their stuff, that trading simulator, like I said, I highly recommend it. It's just uh, tradingsim.com. You know, there's no referral code or anything. It's just a tool that I like. It's just like Realtick. I highly recommend Realtick. You don't have to tell them I sent you, right? Just go look at it. If you like the software, then use it. And if you like something else better, if it's a better psychological fit, then use that by all means. But I'm just trying to show you what it is that we do. What's on screen right now is sort of a typical um, day of trading the XRVs. XRVs tend to, you know, put up somewhere around 20 points a month in profitability. So if you look at this graph, what you can see is um, here over the course of time, we've had a very stable uh, distribution of profits on these. You can see that March was on the lean side. September was a little bit on the lean side. Generally speaking though, you know, it's, it's a month like September that'll throw you for a loop because these are not trades that typically have uh, big drawdowns. September, the first two weeks of September was the first time that it happened. And one of our guys, um, Goran, you know, Goran goes through and he models this stuff extensively. He came to us and said, you know, guys, I had, I had six points of drawdown in the first two weeks of uh, September. That's the worst drawdown I've ever had with this stuff. He says, you know, what do you think is going on? And I said, well, Goran, what, what's your model say when you go through and you look at this historically over years? And he says, well, it, it shows about, you know, a six point drawdown being, being the maximum drawdown. And then he followed it up with, but that doesn't mean that I wanted to experience the maximum drawdown. Well, the good news is it started tracking the way that it has been, uh, you know, once we got back into the month and over the course of the month, it got back on its feet. And then here we are in October and it's just going gangbusters, right? So we're going to, my guess is we're going to close out October somewhere around 25 points per share. So that is um, Fastball, which is the foundation of uh, what it is that we do. And that is going to give you a feel for those first two trades, right? The textbook um, Fastball setup and the, uh, the XRV variant. So XRV, you know, is it harder to trade? I, I don't think so. You know, I think it's it's every bit as easy to trade as the, you know, as the garden variety uh, expansion of range and volume setup. The key is going to be just get into those data sets when you're looking around the site. Pull down the spreadsheets, pull down, you know, Julian Adrian's results, pull down the, uh, uh, the trading plans from the night before. What I really recommend you do is just take all those, you get access to so many trading plans. Like I said, it goes back to 2006 take those, plug them into a trading simulator and just trade them for that day going forward and just see, hey, if I do this by the rules, if I trade this the way that these professional traders are trading it, where do I wind up, right? Prove it to yourself. I, I am not ever looking to sell anybody anything. I've, been, I've worked with umpteen marketing companies who do nothing but complain about it and I just don't care because I figure you're going to sell yourself. If this is something you want to do, we only have room in our lives to work with about 40 people a year. And when we do these intensive training sessions, these uh, boot camps, like we're off to Miami Beach tonight because that's where we do our boot camp. Uh, love doing it there. It's a great atmosphere to, to do something like this. Very relaxed, emphasizes what we think trading is about, which is lifestyle. But I don't want somebody there who was sold into coming. I want somebody there who wanted to be there and sold themselves. Um, so over the course of the next two weeks, you're going to get a call from uh, uh, Victor. You know, Victor's our customer relationship manager. He's just going to walk you through how to use the website, how to find these plans, what to do with them once you find them. And then if you have questions, you know, he's your point guy in terms of knowing what it is that, uh, you know, you're going to be looking at next. So if you have any questions about um, Fastball or XRV, um, go ahead and type them in. I think I'm going to answer them at the end because of the delay. I don't think we want to wait 10 seconds here because, uh, you know, we're waiting on the software. But the next thing that I'd like to get into is going to be uh, trading these opening gap setups. And this is really a trade that put me on the map. It's very interesting that this is what I'm known for because it was sort of a secondary trade for us initially. But I've got a gap trading strategy that 
if you've never approached things from the standpoint of a statistic, of a behavioral statistic, is going to blow your socks off. Because it's a really easy statistic to wrap your head around. Most of you guys I know already are engineers and you like math anyways. And for those of you who aren't, this is going to be some pretty easy math, okay? Because we're taking it back and, and moving into a statistic that just about everybody can understand. So with that said, let me tell you what the prerequisites are for understanding how this gap uh, strategy works. So the first thing is, when Julie and I developed this strategy way back in 1996, 97, we were looking at this um, from the standpoint of we were graduate students, we were working on our PhDs, and we needed data, right? You always need data. If you guys remember grad school, if you've been to grad school, you know, if you haven't been, you know, God bless you because it was something else. But if you were through that whole experience, then you know that a good portion of your day is preoccupied with figuring out how in the heck am I going to get in front of enough data so that I can create some meaningful research and get out of this place before I drown in my student debt. So we started by looking at uh, not true range, which is on screen here. We were looking at the implied volatility of the front month contract for any given stock on the option side of it. And then we were looking for a two standard deviation move in terms of that volatility measure to tell us, hey, we've got a gap that's likely to reverse. What we found out, though, was that if we go and shift the focus to true range, right? You guys know what range is, right? Range is just the, the high minus the low of any given day's bar. True range takes into account the gap. So what true range does is it says the true range of a stock, not average true range, right? If your software has average true range, you have to change the how many periods it averages value. You're going to change that to one. So you just get one day's data. But the true range takes the greater value of that high minus the low or the absolute value of today's high minus yesterday's close or today's low minus yesterday's close. And what that then gives you is the move that represents everything, including the gap. So in this case, if the high price was $50.10 and the close of the prior session was 49 bucks, true range is going to be $1.10 for the day. So what's that do for us? Well, I can tell you, we've got a set of assumptions that things need to fit into when we do a statistic. And the first thing that you're working on when you assume something in statistics is that you've got a normal distribution. Distribution isn't skewed. We've got a whole separate set of things that we do for skewed distributions. This one assumes a normal distribution and it assumes, as I said, that true range is a, volatility, is a proxy for volatility. Why do we need a proxy? Because we did a bunch of work on volatility that proved volatility is mean reverting and we then had to do a bunch of correlations to prove that true range was a proxy for that volatility so that we could plug it into this guy right here. This is a standard normal distribution. And what happens with our gap trade is we're looking to see in terms of that true range did we move out two standard deviations, right, away from our mean? The mean is just that mu in the middle there, that, that funny looking U you see at the bottom of the chart there, right in the middle of the, that uh, bell-shaped curve, that's mu. One standard deviation on either side of mu, 68.2% of the volatility that we're going to expect to see. If you go out to that two standard deviation mark, you've now accounted for more than 95% of the move that you expect to see on the morning, right? So the data has moved, the price data has moved out into the 95% tail. Does that guarantee you you're going to move back to the mean? Absolutely not. All it guarantees you is you've seen now at this point 95% of the move into the tails of that distribution that you can expect to see. So if that throws you for a little bit of a loop, you know, don't let it. What we're looking to have happen is based on the fact that we've got access to the standard normal distribution and that we know 
that we're out on the ends of the, of, the, of the distribution, we're out on the tails, as they say, we know that we've got a very high probability of moving back towards the average. And we are only looking for that move once we get price confirmation in the form of our opening five minutes, 10 minutes, or 15 minutes of trading. I'm going to show you exactly what it is that we're looking for there in a second. So let me just show you quickly what our calculation is doing. There is no black box here, right? Adrian and Julie are very open about everything that we do. So the two of us are all about teaching people how to do things. And uh, as I said, you want to work with us, you'll work with us. Um, at the very least, I'm hoping you go home with something here today that makes some sense for you. You see the true range data there? So that would be day one through day 10. Each day, we just have the software calculate what's the true range. You can do this in a spreadsheet. You can do this, you know, Trader Insight, we've got a scanner that goes through and automatically finds all these things for you. You can do it in, there's a bunch of ways that you can come up with what I'm about to show you. That true range data for days one through 10, I plug into this formula. It's a simplified uh, formula for the standard deviation. You see on the bottom there, the denominator is N. So don't anybody start hammering me here for why isn't it N minus one. This is a power thing that, that uh, you know, we've looked at pretty extensively. N as the denominator. Each one of those X's is just that those uh, day one through 10, and your software is going to do this. So this is the last time you have to look at this math if you don't want to look at it again. But I want you to know what it is. I don't believe in not knowing what the calculation is that you're basing a decision on. Then after we sum all those true range minus average true range, we square it, and that gets rid of any negative number. We then divide it by n, which is 10. I just used 10 periods of data to calculate whether the gap is an outlier. And then the next thing that I do is I now know that I've got one standard deviation there. I have my software multiply one standard deviation by two. So in this case, that would be 98 cents. I add it to the mean, right? The mean true range is $1.25. That tells me that this stock had to gap by $1.25 plus 98 cents in order to be two standard deviations out. And if it did, then I'm looking for something like this to occur. So now this is a five minute chart. And on my five minute chart, what I am looking for is an opening gap, right? So yesterday we had a five minute bar up into the close. This morning it gaps down. Software comes back and says, hey, it's a two standard deviation opening move. What am I going to do with it? So I call this trade Baltimore chop, by the way. So again, this is a baseball metaphor. And uh, if you get to know me, I'll, I'll explain to you exactly why this looks just like an old Baltimore Orioles trick to me. But that move down in the morning is just the first bar that we were looking to see something happen in. So that first bar starts painting a picture for us of what it is that we're going to look for as the rest of these bars form. There is the possibility that we're going to have a second bar entry. But in this case, I can tell you that the bar that actually winds up having our entry trigger is that lowest bar. And we're going to look to get in just a tick above the high of that bar. And we're going to target the open of that next bar. So what is it that I'm looking for here? Essentially, we're treating opening gaps even though we have now, we're building this 95% confidence interval, right? We're treating this opening gap as a pullback, right? And what do you do with a pullback? You just keep looking for the deepest high in this case. The deepest high bar is where we're going to look to fade back up into the open. And what are we looking to fade it to? We're looking to get to the level of price that represents the area that the, the designated market maker in the case of a, of a NYSE listed security or the market makers in general, where were they willing to make an, an, an active liquid market around the opening bell and what happened after they started making that market? So when price gets back up into the range of that first bar, the thing that I'm going to expect to see happen when it gets up to that opening tick is pretty much the same thing that I saw happen the first time that it was there. So in the case of, you know, this particular 
fictitious trade here, right? These are idealized bars we're looking at. What we're expecting to have happen is we're going to get to our, our target price and then price might extend a little bit, but ultimately we're expecting it to move back down into the range. And over the course of the session, we're no longer looking for these trades to set up at all. So we look at these only in the first 30 minutes of trading. And that's because of things like skew and kurtosis and things that you can expect to see happen once distributions have moved into new distribution territory. So things have happened that have moved the stock and now the stock is trading somewhere other than where we had originally expected to, to see it move. We're just looking for that move towards the mean. Once it gets towards the mean, I'm not betting on anything happening, right? It might wind up being a gap and go. It might, uh, uh, you know, might gap and fade. I don't care. I'm looking for a reaction to what's happening in that open. Bernard Baruch, right? He said, you're, this was 100 years ago, you, your job as a speculator, you want to be a successful speculator? You have to anticipate the anticipators. That's what we're doing right here. So let's look at where I get this data from. So in the morning at TraderInsight.com, I've got a gap scanner that was built. That's a custom built uh, scanner that runs on our platform for us. If that's something you're interested in, you'll know it after you've been working with it for a while. If you've built your own scanner, I mean, you can do things like this in, uh, you know, with Excel DDEs. You can do this with, uh, you know, radar screen and trade station. You can do this in Thinkorswim. You can set up your own gap scanners. Um, you know, more power to you. You just do this wherever you're going to do it. But you can see here that what I look to do is I'm separating or I'm having this scanner separate the S&P 500, the S&P 400, and news gaps. And what I'm looking for with, when I say news gaps, is I'm looking for garden variety earnings news. So this is not, uh, for me, a, uh, a case of... I'm always going to fade the news. So what I'm looking to have happen here is if the stock opens and it opens significantly lower, you can see there we have the list and they're broken out S&P 5, 4, and the news. What I'm looking at is to see is there an overlap between the stock that gapped and then we, we match it up with some news feeds that we have. All of this stuff happens instantly, right? This is all on a dedicated Apache server that feeds this back to uh, Julia and myself and to our clients. You can very, very quickly look and see whether this was an earnings-driven gap. So we've now refined this even further to where earnings uh, are separated from the other news because what you don't want to do with this, when you check your news source, you never want to trade this against what I call an institutional calamity, right? So when you get one of these situations where, you know, like Tilray, uh, you know, a month ago, uh, CEO gets on, on uh, uh, you know, Kramer's show, makes a bunch of crazy statements, and the next morning the stock, you know, runs 150 points in each direction, $150 a share in each direction. That's not a tradable gap to me because you're as likely to be caught on the wrong side of that thing as you are to get on the right side. What I want is a gap that's caused by a, a company has released an earnings announcement. And that earnings announcement, you know, either beat or disappointed and did so in a way that it doesn't really make sense for the stock to have moved where it moved to, right? The fundamental picture hasn't changed that much and the market has overreacted. Market tends to overreact to these things. Just always has been and always will be the case. You get some news out there you know, that a, a CEO is sitting somewhere in a South American jail cell or something, that's a different story. That's a fundamental change to the picture of the company. You don't know what's coming next. You have no clue what event is going to follow on the heels of a material change to the management of the company that was unexpected. So in that case, we just avoid it, right? We're not even looking at it. I don't care. I've got plenty of opportunities to take these trades every single day, and I don't need to force them. So you're going to see when you join us in the first hour trading pit, which I highly recommend that you do. Again, it's open house for you. You can come in and have a look around. You'll see a fellow named Rick Kipp. Um, you know, he came to us by way of, uh, uh, he was actually working for TSA at the time. And, uh, you know, he said to us as we were on our way to Miami Beach to do a boot camp, boy, you know, if I could make $300, $400 a day 
doing what it is that, you know, because he's looking at the cameras and he's looking at the microphones and all this stuff. Hey, where are you guys going? And we told him. He says, if I could make three, four, five hundred dollars a day, I'd quit my job and this, that's what I would be doing for a living. Well, so the moral of the story is he quit his job. This is what he does for a living. He's not paid to run that room. He's just there talking about what he's trading. You'll hear Goran in there as well. You'll, you'll see a bunch of people who have been through boot camp with us. They're there to support each other. So it's not the moderators of some crazy chat room you're listening to. You're just listening to the people do what they do in their work. And you can also then just evaluate the tools that they're using and whether or not something's a good fit for you. If something makes you nervous, move on to the next thing. We've got plenty of things that we do that you can learn to profit from and have a very relaxed kind of a, a trading business. You don't need to jump headfirst into something just because it looks exciting or because it looks like it's a, a big money maker or something. So that's just a caveat. But then let's move on and let's take a look at how these positions are managed. So. You're looking here at a five minute chart and you can see that one of the stocks that gapped there was uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines and it plays out pretty much textbook. And a lot of these, you know, if you go and give them the opportunity to play out textbook, this is the kind of thing that you're going to see. So we see that nice drifting pullback into the morning. We've got that green line there is the go line. That's where we're going to enter a long position and we have a real tight stop loss. So a lot of times what I do for a stop on these is when I'm first looking at it, I'm going to set my stop down in the range below the low of uh, you know bar that's making a move. And then as soon as I'm triggered in, I'll use a stop loss like this one right at the low of the bar that actually triggers the long. So in this case, right, we've got our first target at that blue line. And I intentionally use this example because this one kept going and usually they don't keep going. But the moral of the story is I don't care, right? For me, the most important thing is that I feel like I can plan my trade and then I can trade my plan. I know what I'm going to do before I do it. And I'm not sitting here, right? Lit up first thing in the morning, trying to figure out, you know, gee, can I ride the momentum? Because as much as these look like momentum trades, I am not a momentum trader. I am looking to trade on the side of the institutions 100% of the time. I'm an order flow trader. That's what I do for a living. And that's what I'm trying to encourage other people to do for a living as well. So when we enter that order again, it's similar and it's very easy to change. You can load these up as macros and, uh, you know, just have the order pop up. Once you put that first order in, you can change the other parameters, right? So you don't have to go and, and redo the order constantly. But in this case, you can see it's pretty simple. $54.14. That's the price that we wanted to get long this stock. $54.20. That's the worst slip I'm willing to take. Initially, you're going to have, when you're looking at these, the inclination to say, boy, I've got to give room for more slippage here because there's a lot of volatility. The reality is that volatility usually brings you right back down into that range. And if you allow for a bigger slip, you're probably going to give it up. But a few seconds later, you're going to have the opportunity to, uh, you know, to get in right where you thought you were going to be able to. And what you need to keep in mind is that's the difference between starting out and becoming profitable very quickly or having to watch it dig itself out of a hole. Uh, when it first sets itself up and you know over the course of the day this thing will just take care of itself and as I said the fact that it is going to pop me out for a profit right there or it's going to take me out for a loss right there right that doesn't really even enter my consciousness once the trades on I mean everybody cares right everybody cares that their trades follow through and I'm no different but I think that you know, once you're doing this kind of thing, the important thing to be able to do is just put it out there and have the courage of your convictions and just say, you know, I'm going to trade my plan the way that I anticipated doing it. And, uh, you know, if things go my way, that's great. If things don't go my way, it's, uh, you know, not terrific. But the important measure of my success is that uh, I traded my plan exactly. Okay, so again, right? We're separating S&P 500. We're separating S&P 400. We've got lots of times to look through these multiple symbols. This is just another day of data here. This is a little bit different in terms of the way that this one went off, right? We've got a second bar entry on this. We've got a stop loss down under that third bar, right? So the second bar set the threshold. The third bar is the bar that actually got us in. 
And I wanted to show you this one just because our target right there and look what happened to the stock when it hit it. That's a much more typical thing to see first thing in the morning. And as you can see, like I said, I am not looking to reinvent the wheel. I'm not predicting which stocks are going to make a, uh, are, are going to close the gap. All I'm predicting is I've got myself out into the 95% uh, confidence interval and I'm looking for evidence that we're about to see a fade move. So that is the Baltimore Chop uh, gap scan that, uh, um, that I use and uh, trade. Um, I see there's a question there about using Realtek. Realtek is going to depend on the broker, so you, 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 um, you should be able with Schwab. Schwab has an excellent active trader platform. Um, so I don't know exactly how that compares to Realtek, but I know that it, it definitely compares. We've got people uh, on our program who are using uh, the Active Trader program from Schwab and are happy with it. So you know you can definitely investigate that. Realtek is broker independent. It's not um, you know it's not tying you to a, a particular brokerage, but whether or not it's going to work with Schwab is something that I'm uncertain of. So you can use it with Vision, you can use it with Lightspeed, you can use it with Cobra, you can use, I can, I can name 20 brokers right off the bat, and then certainly if you're an institutional trader, it's available for every institutional trade desk in the world. Um, it's more expensive than your typical trading software, it's $350 a month or so, but you know most brokers, if you do the kind of um, traffic that we do in our business, most brokers will rebate you then the cost of uh, Realtek at the end of the month. So in our case, it's uh, 100 round trip trades and we get rebated and we definitely do that over the course of a month. So let me tell you something um, sort of crazy on a non-related note because we're going to call this a, a session here. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's interested in this, but it's just something that we're doing next year. We travel all the time with our boot camp guys. and. Um, you know, this year on Trader Insight, if you if you check the activities, um, you'll see that we do a bunch of ski trips. We do a bunch of fun stuff, and you're more than welcome to, to come and join us. Anybody who's trading and wants to uh, meet us there, you know, we're at Mammoth. We're in, you know, we either go to Mammoth or we go to Colorado or we go to Utah. Wherever the snow is good is where our guys are gonna are gonna hook up. We're all gonna meet next year, though, in July. End of July, we're doing a trip. Uh, with the folks at Money Show, we're going to Bordeaux. It's a river cruise. It's uh, it's going to be uh, Dan Gramza will also be speaking there. He's an options guy, and uh, and myself, and we are going to uh, you know just do about an hour a day of business, just talking about trading, and uh, the rest of the time is just this lovely cruise through Bordeaux. So if you're interested in that kind of a thing. Um, you know, just pop Julie an email. It's julie at traderinsight.com and she'll tell you who to get in touch with. That's just a, a weird aside for, uh, you know, for this particular session because it definitely, uh, you know, the slide was just kind of in there. So I wanted to make sure that uh, it made some sense as, uh, as it popped up. So um, with that, you know, those are some trading strategies that, uh, you know, I think you can focus on. You'll also see when you come and do your uh, your open house with us, something called the Nasdaq Scalper, that one um, you know just pop into that first hour trading pit. I've got lots and lots of videos available at Trader Insight. You just go to the bottom of the home page. You'll get access to uh, you know hundreds of trading videos that show you how it is that we do what we do and give you a better idea if we're a good fit for you and if we're somebody you'd like to like to work with. So with that, I would like to. Uh, just move on here, take questions if you have them, and uh, you know, let me just turn around here and uh, I'm going to look at a monitor and see if there's uh, anything that you folks want to cover. The recording of this will be available uh, probably tomorrow. And um, also, if, uh, if you're looking for the downloads, those will be coming out tonight. Um, you should get it shortly after the webinar ends. and. Uh, you get an ebook that you can download, and then within a day or two, you'll get permissioned into the site. I'm going to be traveling, so I don't like to have people on on trials while we're going to be away. And uh, you know, let me see if uh, 
let me see if I can talk to you guys personally and then maybe uh, you know get you going on something that makes sense for you. So if you are somebody who's coming to the boot camp, then I'm looking forward to seeing you. I know that a couple of you are probably going to watch this as a replay if you haven't uh, tuned in live. We've got a bunch of people who are going to watch the replay. That's always the case. If you're watching the replay, send me your questions. It's Adrian, A-D-R-I-A-N, at TraderInsight.com. I answer things as quickly as I can. It's also um, very easy for me to just say, call me or send me a text. Um, my personal cell is 310-804-2248. I always prefer people text me before, uh, before they call, and then I will just let you know. I'll say, hey, I'll talk to you in uh, you know 20 minutes, or I'll talk to you in an hour, or maybe it'll be tomorrow afternoon or whatever it is, but we can definitely get on the phone and discuss anything that you've got any issues with or anything that you have any questions about. So I hope it's worth you popping in here today. This was our first time fooling with this technology. Seems like it went okay. Uh, next time around, I'll definitely be a little bit smoother. But um, as I said, if you've got something that you want to ask me before we end, then pop it into the chat box. And uh, otherwise, I want to thank you for being here today and wish you good trading. Uh, yeah, you can, Fred, you can join the, um, you can definitely join the trade room. Um, and really, you, you can't go to boot camp until you've sort of been through the paces with things like the, uh, um, uh, the, the trading room. And, um, you know, I want to make sure that for everybody who's involved with what we're doing, that it makes really good sense to you. So, you know, we've had people recently, as a matter of fact, who they get offended by the fact that we turn away more people than we accept to a boot camp. But that's not, that's, you have to think about this experience, right? A boot camp is a, um, you know, it's certainly more expensive than, than just signing up for a, a trading service, but it's a very involved process. So it's weeks of, online training and you know 650 pages of manual to work through and then it's four days of live trading or live training in at this you know event in miami beach and there's 20 people there and our goal is always to make sure that everybody is you know gonna mesh and everybody's on the right page so that we get people there with sort of similar levels of experience and you know they understand uh, you know why they're there they ex understand what they're trying to accomplish and by the time they've been to a boot camp you know, we need to kind of talk to them plenty. Um, like I said, we're both psychologists, so we err on the side of the thing that's really going to determine whether or not you can succeed as a trader is whether or not we think you're a good fit psychologically for what it is that we do. Um, you know, and some people are a little bit put off by that, and it has nothing to do with you as a person or, or you know, whether or not we think you can succeed as a trader in general, it just has to do with, well, how well does this person match what we're doing? You know, a lot of people are in this for the rush. A lot of people are in this because, um, you know, they sort of equate gambling and, and trading or, or, you know, systems and trade. We're order flow traders. So, yeah, come to the, go to the trading room, spend time in the first hour trading pit, look at all the materials that are available on the site, you know, the trading plans, the history, the, you know, what it is that we do, talk to us, you know, get to know us, get to know Victor, get to know everybody who's involved with this. And, you know, that's when you'll be able to tell if this is something that would be a good fit for you, you know, the more formal training. But absolutely, uh, I, I, I am definitely, like I said, I'm not offering anybody, you can't buy anything here today if you wanted to. Right? I am not looking to sell you something. I am looking to see if you are perhaps going to be one of the 20 people we're going to work with next go around. That's all. Anybody else have questions? Okay, so Bob 
yeah, we have, um, you're going to receive access to everything that, um, that I talked about. You're going to get access to pretty much everything that we do on the site. You're going to find out in a big hurry, we are not a big operation. So as much as you see that, you know, I'm speaking somewhere, right? I'm hired to go speak places because of, we've got a very unique history, um, and we love traveling. So we're a very small shop and the services that we have on the site are just, that's it. Then that's all we do. And you're getting permissioned into pretty much everything, uh, for the next couple of weeks. And if you need longer, right, if, if at the end of the two weeks you're saying, you know, geez, I'm not exactly sure, uh, that this is for me, then, you know, just tell Victor or tell Julie or me that you need more time and we'll just give you more time. I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not into this whole, you know, get somebody to spend $99 or get somebody to spend $399 thing. What I want is to make sure that I've got lots and lots of happy uh, clients on the site. So you can, you know, kick the tires and take this thing for a test drive and see how it fits for you. And then, you know, all I ask in return is log in. You know, you get an email every night and, and, you know, the one thing that we do keep track of is sort of how many people are receiving the trials and then never go and download this stuff. Um, it, it is our life's work. It's something that we've spent an just immeasurable amount of time doing. And I think if you give it the opportunity to, you know, prove itself, then, you know, what you'll see is that it works, or at least it works for us and the people we work with. And if it doesn't work for you, that's okay, right? Then, you know, there's nobody's, nobody's got any pressure here about anything, right? Just let me know. I would very much appreciate it if you let me know, uh, you know, exactly what works for you, what doesn't work for you and why, you know, gee, if you explained this a different way, or if you did a better job of this, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, illuminating things, Julie and I are both, you know, we were trained to be professors and, and talking to people and teaching people is something that we love. So, um, you know, the feedback would be great. And also, you know, you're asking about a list of upcoming boot camps. So the boot camps are always in, um, they're right now. So end of October, right? Beginning of November, this, this is always boot camp time. And then May is always boot camp. So the end of May. So I like to do it. My birthday's May 20th. I like to do a boot camp right around then. We celebrate my birthday with the guys. It's fun. But, uh, those are the two times uh, of the year that we give up to do these things. And those are the only boot camps that we do. And, you know, between now and then it should be really easy for you to assess whether, you know, this is something that you think you might want to, might want to participate in and then to talk to us and, uh, you know, give us sort of a feeling for what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And then, you know, if, if we say, Hey, this guy's a good match for boot camp, then Victor just sort of puts the logistics together and, you know, takes care of, uh, you know, making sure that you're making sure that you're taken care of essentially. But yeah, so there's, there's upcoming stuff there. You can, uh, you know, definitely check in, uh, with us starting, um, I'm going to say day after tomorrow. So on Wednesday, we'll be settled in to our place in Miami beach. Uh, boot camp itself starts next Sunday. So for those of you who are coming, I'm, I'm looking super forward to, I've already met a bunch of you. We've had dinner and stuff and got to know each other, but, uh, looking forward to meeting you there. And for those of you I haven't met, um, you know, we'll, we'll have, uh, we'll have drinks that first night and, and, uh, loosen everybody up and get everybody to know each other. All right, guys, it was great. I don't think I have any other questions here, but, uh, join us again. I'd appreciate it. And, uh, you know, like I said, I appreciate your time. Um, thanks for showing up here today and, uh, I will show you. Oh, we've got one more. We've got a couple more questions here, but we'll just leave the. Uh, have a look over here. Can you do the boot camp remotely? Um, you can. You know, I prefer. I prefer to have you there. Um, you can. You can definitely do it remotely, and it's much like this, right? It's participating remotely. We tend to do that for. So alumni can always come back for free, right? So alumni come to as many boot camps as they want to go to. Some of the alumni are uh, from overseas, right? So Ian and Robert and uh, and Wayne, you know, we've got everything from from England to Australia to uh, um, uh, South Africa, 
And we've got people who come in from all over the world. We've got people from Taiwan come in to do this. Yeah, so those people tend to want to participate remotely on their second boot camp or third boot camp. It makes for a real nice refresher for people to do it again. So, you know, I'm going to say if you can get yourself there, it'd be terrific. And if you can't get yourself there, then, uh, you know, we'll have to interact like this and, uh, and talk on the phone, I guess, unless you live in Southern California or someplace that they're skiing, in which case we can get together and talk. But yeah, so. All right, you guys. I think that's it, and I've got a plane to catch. I don't see anything else. I'm glad you enjoyed the session. That makes me very happy and, uh, you know, sort of weird and uncomfortable as this whole thing is, having cameras all over my office. I enjoyed it too. So we'll be doing more of this kind of stuff. All right. So best trader education anywhere, right? Only from TraderInsight.com.